Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to have you joining us today um, for the first broadcast in our new webinar series, Forward Thinking with Vitality. Uh, we're kicking off our winter program today with a really meaty and topical issue um, around kind of growing your protection business at a time of market volatility and a, and a challenging market. Um, as part of our winter program, we'll be following this up next year in January uh, with a broadcast focusing on uh, the health insurance industry and some of the challenges in that market. Uh, and then in February, we'll be looking at uh, workplace well-being, um, a really kind of topical issue at the moment as well. Um, I'm joined by uh, two excellent speakers today um, on panel. Unfortunately, Charlotte couldn't be with us, but um, I think hopefully we agree that uh, between, between ourselves, we'll hopefully be able to uh, you know, do justice to this um, kind of really big issue. Um, so we've got Matt Chapman, who many of you will, will know, um, is an advisor and, and protection coach. And I'm sure lots of you will have seen his um, videos and content on LinkedIn and other social media and, and perhaps seen him speak at various industry events um, over the years. So, Matt, great to have you with us. Thank you very uh, much. Today. Good to be here. Excellent. And, um, and Gary King, um, Vitality's head of protection specialists. Um, again, some of you may have seen him, him last year or sorry, earlier this year um, on a webinar that, uh, that we put out around income protection and, um, and Gary uh, spends a lot of time kind of going into firms and coaching them and, and, and talking about kind of protection and how to discuss protection with their clients. So again, Gary, great to have you joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, so as I said, a, a really kind of obviously quite a big uh, topic that we'll be getting stuck into today, um, growing your protection business in a challenging market. Obviously, there's lots of kind of things going on at the moment that um, that are impacting our industry, whether it's kind of interest rate rises over the last couple of years, um, obviously kind of inflation continues to be stubbornly high, um, various kind of economic headwinds um, impacting us. And of course, you know, the cost of living crisis that, that doesn't show any signs of um, abating, all kind of impacting um, the, the both the protection industry, but probably fair to say the wider um, advice industry as well. So, um, and aside from those economic challenges, obviously there's kind of various health health challenges as well from kind of deteriorating population health, um, record numbers of people out of work due to ill health and you know, lots of different things have kind of highlighted the importance of protection and we obviously came out of the COVID pandemic, um, which really kind of highlighted just how important it was that, that households, um, you know, were financially resilient and particularly with the ongoing cost of living crisis. Um, obviously, we're also kind of grappling in a new regulatory landscape with consumer duty um, that's come in this year. And, you know, it's kind of set to, set to shake things up a little bit um, in terms of the kind of uh, the regulations that we're all having to adhere to, um, particularly that sort of focus on uh, meeting client needs and avoiding foreseeable harm and, and obviously delivering fair value. So lots kind of swirling around at the moment in the industry. Obviously, lots of advisors looking for opportunities to kind of grow their business at this time um, and, and sort of you know, address some of those challenges that we're facing um, as an industry. So we'll be looking today um, to discuss a couple of kind of key points. So, um, you know, how can we kind of navigate this challenging and volatile market um, and uh, offering some, some views on, on how best to, um, to sort of tackle some of those challenges we face and, um, and deliver kind of uh, protection advice to consumers at a time where it's probably needed more than ever. Um, we'll be looking at you know, products themselves, how are they evolving to meet changing consumer needs and what does the industry need to do to address those evolving consumer needs and, and make sure that we're offering the right solutions for consumers. And then just touching again on, on that sort of consumer duty point and the impact um, that that's having on the industry. So I guess just to kick things off, so we've, we've touched a little bit a bit there on kind of market volatility. And I suppose, Matt, I'll come to you first. So. As I said, we're, you know, we are kind of facing a, a whole raft of different challenges. You spend a lot of time going out there sort of speaking to advice firms. And what are sort of some of the challenges you're coming up against and, and, and how can the industry kind of respond to those? Yes, yeah, a great question. I think initially the biggest challenge of all is this perception that we're entering a difficult and challenging time. I mean, even what we're talking about today is this idea that it's a difficult time. The truth of it is it's not any more difficult than it ever has been. If anything, the need for protection is definitely much more prevalent these days than before, because as we go through a cost of living crisis and we see inflationary rises, the importance of having protection has never been more so. The idea that if there's any kind of short-term break in income or anything like that, it could mean that people are in significant financial difficulty. I think the advice that I'm tending to give firms at the minute, rather than thinking about, because I think there's a, a misconception that we're all about trying to get new business in, is actually about getting the basics right. I think as organisations, if we want to grow our protection business, we don't necessarily need to bring that many more clients in. 
we need to think about making sure we're doing what we can with what we've got. That is getting more from less, essentially. So if you think about getting the basics right, I talked to a lot of firms, for example, about when clients are coming through the door and making those initial inquiries, are we making sure that we're doing it the right way? So we'll use mortgage firms as an example. So you have a client come into the mortgage firm and for whatever reason, we can't quite get the mortgage. The affordability might not be there. The interest rate isn't what the client wants. There's a problem with the house purchase. Are we still looking to arrange protection for that client and then send them on their way? Are we looking to get their mortgage ready? Are we making the most of that opportunity? Or are a lot of firms saying, sorry, we can't do anything today, off you go and let's hope we meet again in the future. So there's little things like this, you know, annual reviews, speaking to your clients regularly. If we're looking at arranging longer term fixed rate products, for example, in the mortgage world, are we doing enough to keep the clients on the side? Are we reviewing their protection needs regularly? The research that I've done is a lot of people, when they go out and do these annual review type contracts and discussions with their clients, we're finding an uptick in the amount of protection revenue that's coming in because each time we speak to a client a year later, we're finding they've increased their expenses, they've you know, took on a different type of job, they need to increase their income cover or whatever it needs to be. So I think this is really about making sure that we double down on what we've got. Not always be focused on trying to get new business in, but making the most of what we have. And I think that's the kind of advice I'd be giving a lot of firms right now, which is, yes, by all means, still try and attract new clients, but make sure you're optimizing your processes, make sure you're making the most out of everything you've got as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess the interesting thing, Gary, isn't it, is that actually we, we talk about all these sort of challenges the industry faces, whether it's cost of living crisis or whatever it might be, but actually that's kind of heightened that the importance of protection. It's, it's not diminished the need for protection. It's it's heightened, hasn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I think certainly we see people's budgets being stretched further and further. Uh, obviously, we've done a lot of um, studying into kind of savings, how much people, you know, the typical household in the UK has significantly lower savings than it needs. You know, there's always been the thought process that you need at least three months of a rainy day fund. But how many families actually have that? And we're seeing that the increased stretch on people's budget is arguably eating into that. So to Matt's point, meaning you're needing to protect that loss even more. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, uh, some of you may have seen the FCA published some research um, earlier in the year around kind of highlighting that the actually you know, the lack of financial resilience that, that households are facing at this time and you know, that real kind of heightened need for, for protection. But I guess advisors are kind of, you know, they, there is a concern, I suppose, around, you know, uh, all of these different issues, whether it's sort of disposable income and, um, you know, concerns around kind of cancellations and this sort of stuff. I suppose what's quite interesting as well, we've, we've just had the Amy Viewpoint research um, published in the last couple of weeks, and um, that sort of highlighted this, this sort of perception gap. But the fact that there is that persistent protection gap as well and those differences in perceptions between what consumers understand about protection and, and kind of what advisors think in terms of kind of the value of protection and having those. I mean, how do we kind of break down those, those barriers and ensure that we're, we are closing that protection gap? It's a really good point. I'm glad you brought that up because actually perception, I think, is one of the biggest issues. So, you know, you raised the issue of, you know, advisors feeling it's a very challenging time. I believe that's perception. I genuinely believe that's perception. I don't think budget is any more of an issue than it was before. I don't believe disposable income is an issue any more than it was before. Of course, in the news, in people's pockets, we see the difference. But as I say, the idea that that is a barrier for advisors is very much a perception issue. And I think actually, the key to this one is education, right? So if you're an advisor and you're sat in front of a client, if you were to educate your client as to why income is so important, why it's so critical, in a post-COVID world, when we've seen our bills go up and we realize how vulnerable we are without that income coming in, I think it's really a question of sitting down with the clients. And rather than trying to sell insurance contracts to clients, it's more about having that educational process to, to bridge that perception gap you were just talking about. What I've noticed when I've been doing my coaching is when advice firms actually do that, we see a huge uptake in, in clients accepting the recommendations because they suddenly understand the importance and the need because it's been educated and explained in such a way that the client can't argue. And actually, when you talk about things like disposable income, it's like, in reality, the disposable income that someone's got is their available budget towards protection. You know, you talk about education. How many advisors actually sit down, go through a budget planner with their client, highlight this income need that they've got, and then talk about what are you spending your money on? Is there a way that we could cut back on some of this unnecessary expenditure and maybe direct that towards protecting the very essential needs that you've got? And I think what's happening is we're seeing this, this change, this shift from, okay, we're more like order takers in the way we do things into, actually, let's really adopt and embrace this idea of becoming an advisor and we should advise on protection in the same way we do on wealth or on mortgages it's not about 
taking orders from clients about what insurance contracts they want. It's about sitting down and discussing financial resilience with our clients and showing ways in which we can boost them, educate them, show them how they can protect what matters most to them, and they'll be far more engaged and likely to accept those recommendations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I guess, you know, Gary, you spend a lot of time going and speaking to advice firms and stuff. And, uh, yeah, how can we kind of, as an industry, I suppose, help? Ad- and I think probably I'm thinking here that there's obviously lots of protection specialists that having these conversations day in, day out, but there's mortgage advisors, there's financial planners. You know, how do we kind of overcome some of those perception barriers and, and, and get advisors to sort of understand the importance of protection and, and, and have those conversations with their clients? I think it's definitely a, an interesting challenge. It's, I suppose, I mean, obviously something you're very experienced in that the, the the consideration that you know we have that optimism bias this won't happen to us and of course i sometimes think that where we're engaging our clients in these conversations is, is so important it's almost the the sort of end of the stage almost would you like some fries with that <laughs> you know after yeah. we've gone through doing the thing that you've seen me for rather than introducing that that into the conversation nice and early i think you know some great examples of how we can start doing this is you get to that point in the mortgage application you know you're home is at risk if you're unable to make these payments. You know, asking the question around what is it that could prevent you from making these payments? And then starting to kind of paint that picture. And I think, you know, as Matt said, that it's not just a case of selling an insurance product. This is a, a risk. Obviously, as an advisor, you've identified that need. And we can start plugging in some of the um, products that are available across the market to help, you know, protect against the worst happening effectively. Yeah, and I guess this is no, in, in many respects, now is a kind of time where advisors are need more, needed more than ever. You know, we're, we're sort of seeing consumer attitudes kind of shifting and changing. And I think the Amy research highlighted a couple of really interesting things around kind of, you know, where consumers are going to, to, to purchase these products, where they're going for advice. But I suppose, you know, to help somebody kind of navigate what can be at times quite a complex market, mm-hmm. advisors are needed more than ever, aren't they? There's, this, is, this is kind of the time. And, um, you know, I guess... If we're thinking about, there's also an opportunity here, isn't there, to add value to your business Massively. by having these conversations with a client. Massively, massively. I mean, I, I was working with a, a particular client recently who was saying that he was very busy with mortgages and was really struggling to do the protection side of things. And I actually advised him to stop taking on as many mortgages, which ironically at this point in time is, is probably a, a moot point. But I was saying to him, look, actually you'd be better off taking on less mortgages and spending more time working with the clients to build these robust solutions. And I'd even take what you said and go one step further. And this is where we can add real value as advisors. So if we think about someone's ability to borrow in the first place, that's predicated on the idea that the income's coming in, they've got a deposit or equity, and they've got some sort of credit score that allows them access to these kind of top shelf mortgages. So even when you're doing the affordability stage with a client, before you've even talked about submitting an application for the mortgage, there should be discussion around, well, how, how sustainable is your income? You know, doing an income stress test with the client and then saying, well, look, we're about to go and arrange you a liability here before we even worry about applying. Because often advisors focus on actually protecting the debt once it's been obtained. Well, you've got to obtain it in the first place. You've got to have a, a sustainable income that's eligible enough for you to submit the application and get the debt in the first place. So if we link the protection to the client's main objectives and goals, they're going to be far more receptive to the conversation, aren't they? I mean, laterally, if someone wants to buy a home, they have these dreams and aspirations of becoming a homeowner, we can show them how protection provides the means and the tools to be able to do that, to guarantee. Because at the point when you haven't done it, it's really just an idea. It's a theory. And so adding value for me isn't just, oh, well, here's a really great product and you've got this liability and we need to protect you from it. It's like, let me show you how this enables you to achieve your life goals, to achieve your financial objectives, get where you want to in life. And when I talk about breaking it down to the most simplistic terms, and I often say to people, you know, imagine if I could say to anyone, would you like the option of putting your head on the pillow at night and not having to worry about money again? I think we'd all agree that would be something that we would all aspire towards. Well, ultimately, protection can provide that vehicle. It can provide that feeling, that sensation. So I think we need to stop looking at protection as some sort of, as you say, bolt-on product. You know, would you like fries with that at the end of a conversation? And actually, an integral, embedded part of our advice process, regardless of whether you're doing mortgages, wealth, it's all underpinned by the ability to be financially resilient enough to execute all of these financial plans. So value, for me, is in the education. 
And if you think about a mortgage advisor, they charge a fee to the client, don't they? And they charge a fee simply because, going back to the AMI viewpoint stuff, because they obtain some knowledge or they have some skills or understanding that the client sees of value. So you go and see an advisor because the advisor is going to guide you and navigate you through this sort of turbulent situation and show you the right product for your solution. So why do we then look at protection as something different? Why do we look at it as in some way less valuable or important to get advice on? In actual fact, it's probably the most important product to get financial advice on. And so I often encourage the firms I'm speaking to to just change your perception as much as the clients and that when you're sitting there having these conversations, the value comes from you being able to disseminate something complex into something simple for the client. Break it down into its basic form. You need money every month. Let me show you how we can make sure you can do that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I guess you know, building on that, it's, protection's a kind of cornerstone of, of, of any kind of advice that someone's giving, isn't it? It is. Maybe we all remember Pipsy. Or maybe yeah. it's just me with the grey in the beard that remembers that. But uh, no, and I, you know, regardless of whether it's mortgages, investments, retirement planning, whatever it might look like, you're always talking to the client about you know that very very positive outcome. That you know this is my retirement plan. This is what my retirement looks like. Or I'm buying my home for my family. It's all very positive, but we have to be mindful as early as possible in that conversation that there is a potential stumbling block, which is ultimately your ability to go to work, which is what provides you with the finances to to create all these plans. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I guess that the thing that, that sort of, um, for the protection industry in particular, that kind of changes the game a little bit around this is, is, is probably fair to say consumer duty has, has kind of has, has changed things a little bit. And there definitely seems to be a view now that protection isn't something that can simply be sidelined or, you know, sort of tick box exercise to say, I've had that conversation. So, I mean, in, in your experience, Gary, how, how do you kind of see consumer duty playing into this? What, what, what do you think the impact of consumer duty has been, it's been out there now for a few months, and what, what do you see as the kind of the, the impact of that going forward? I mean, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because we've seen this evolution of the regulation over the years, obviously starting off with rules and then principles, and obviously now we're looking at outcomes. So I think it really is probably the biggest, I suppose, a seismic shift that we've seen in, in what we're ultimately looking for here, rather than worrying about as long as the inputs that we start off with at the beginning are in keeping with these, these guidelines or rules, that should lead to a very positive outcome. Now we are actually you know, monitoring the outcomes, making sure that what we've put in place will continue to stand the test of time. Obviously, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, curveballs coming in over the last few years when it comes to pandemics and cost of living and those sorts of issues. We need to make sure that actually the recommendations we're making today are going to be suitable in light of whatever may happen. And I think, you know, to go back to your point about making sure it's, it's not that transactional sale it is an ongoing relationship. It is maintaining the suitability of your recommendation throughout the length of your recommendation. Obviously, when we talk about protection, certainly that's by and large a long-term recommendation. So I think it is, it is, it's considerable. Obviously, the impact of this and, and and the plans that advisors put in place to make sure that they can monitor this need to be robust and obviously demonstrable from a point of view. If uh, if the regulator does come knocking. Well, I think, sorry, I was going to say, I think the, the, the notion of outcomes has always been there. I mean, the regulator always looks at outcomes and detriment. It's always been there. I think what's great about consumer duty is ultimately remove the excuses. You know, it's removed that idea that, oh, well, you can just arrange a mortgage, or you can arrange this kind of financial product and not have that conversation in the first place. So what it's doing is it's challenging advisors, but I think there's never been a wider range of support. I mean, we're, we're sitting here having a discussion around it and providing resources to advise to help them have better conversations. So I don't think this has been a better time, ironically, to be having these conversations with your customers. Regardless of the consumer duty regulation, I just think now is the perfect time. We've got a captive audience, we've got a situation, economically speaking, that warrants having this conversation, and we've got clients who seem to be more perceptive to it. So why aren't we out there doing these things more often? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, as you say, there's, a, there's obviously there's big opportunities, isn't there? There's a, there's a real opportunity here to for advisors to add value to their businesses, but also add value to, the, to their clients as well. Gary, I think just picking up on, on, on something that, that, that you said and, and, and Matt, perhaps to, to you, you know, you mentioned there that consumer duty sort of changes the game a little bit in terms of kind of moving away from this sort of transactional approach to advice. And I guess, Matt, you know, you're spending your time kind of coaching firms, helping them, helping advisors sort of better understand how to, to position this. And I, I guess that's such an important thing, isn't it? Is that actually, you know, that sort of transactional selling almost a protection products kind of doesn't quite cut it anymore. Not even, not even close. I mean, I'll 
I'm happy to pass over to you in a second, Gary. I was going to say, I had a very convers similar conversation with someone this morning. So we were talking about outcomes and we talked about the idea that the, the average mortgage broker tends to primarily focus on, say, mortgage life insurance. We've arranged a debt, we've arranged a liability, Mr. Clark, we've got to protect you from it. And that's what they'll do. But I asked a question around, OK, well, what is the primary driver and motivator of someone taking mortgage life insurance? And it's often not because they want to pay the bank back. It's not even that they want to pay off the mortgage. It's because they know when they pass away, the idea is I want my family to remain in the family home. That's the principal driver. My argument was then, well, OK, so you've cleared the mortgage and we look and we know that, you know, the average household bills completely dwarf the mortgage payments. So how are we actually getting the client any closer to achieving that desired outcome? If we don't then look at making sure if a primary household income generator passes away, that that family then have the supporting income to be able to remain in the home and pay those bills. And so I think there's this mis misconception that a lot of advisors out there are treating it very transactionally, not through any fault of their own, because I think, you know, generally speaking in the industry, the, the, the kind of training and competence schemes we've had have been a bit subpar, if I'm honest with you, because they tend to be very much sales driven rather than outcomes driven. But we are moving forward with that post-consumer duty. But it's little things like that and thinking about, like you mentioned, the lifelong financial needs of somebody. It's not even, OK, the term of the mortgage. It's, for example, using income protection, protecting someone's ability to keep making those pension contributions so they can enjoy the retirement life they want. It's not about today, tomorrow, a year, two years, five years. It's all the way through to their last days on this earth. It's making sure someone is financially resilient enough to survive and support themselves perpetually. That's where protection provides real value. And I think what's happening in the market is we are shifting away from this transactional single event mindset. I mean, I've seen a lot of advisors even in the past think about, oh, well, when I'm making recommendations, it's like, well, someone's likely to get one illness. Well, we know that many of these illnesses that you experience today, you get recurring issues with. You know, you look at the products that you guys have developed. It's because taking into consideration the idea that actually people don't just tend to get ill. That's it. We're all done and dusted. People get ill. They have recurrences of these issues. They have multiple conditions. This is the real world we live in. And I think we're becoming far more acutely aware of how things work. And the idea of a single event mindset or one party is going to pass away. Well, what if both parties pass away? Have we done suitable protection to show the family and their children are always going to be taken care of? And I think if we start thinking more holistically as advisors, we are going to produce much better outcomes and fill those potential gaps. And therein lies the opportunity. If you are a firm out there and you're thinking, where are the opportunities in this diminishing market? Look back over your clients and think, where are their gaps in what I've done before? Pick up the phone to them and explain how you can plug them and deliver the kind of outcomes that people really want in life. If you do that, you're going to survive this economic crisis with no problem at all. Sorry, I kind of probably stole your thunder there. No, no, not at all. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because you, I wouldn't expect to see many mortgage advisors card read mortgage and mortgage protection advisor. It is a mortgage and protection advisor. It is wider than just the need of, of that mortgage. And I think you know, coming back to the point around sort of the transactional sale, I think it was the Amy report pointed out that it's nearly a third of people will just go straight to a comparison website because they think that's the driving force behind this recommendation. And you know, when we start to look at the typical kind of policies that are built when a client does it themselves, you know, well, a hundred thousand pounds will be fine when actually we know that that's two or three years worth of income in most cases, and it's not even going to touch the sides of, of the mortgage, let alone, of course, the the bills and the other costs that go alongside that. So um, certainly, the the value of advice is you know, thinking, I suppose, wider than just that mortgage that we've arranged for the client. And I think that really helps differentiate yourself, of course, from, from just literally looking at a, a price comparison. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I guess a lot of advisors already, you know, if we're thinking about particularly financial planners, mortgage advisors, they're actually already having these sorts of conversations. You know, financial planners are having, they're not talking about financial products in the sense of, this is what it's going to, you know, this is what it's going to do if, when you retire. It, it, the, the conversation tends to be on what are your goals and objectives. So I guess a lot of advisors are actually already really well positioned to have these conversations, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. And obviously a lot of the planning tools that you have access to nowadays will enable you to put in a, you know, a, a period of absence from work. And obviously you can see the impact that can make, uh, obviously, on the, on the long-term plans. I think it's hilarious that we 
for some reason, look at protection differently. I, I really don't understand it. Ignoring the fact that it is the cornerstone, you're absolutely right. Advisor are out there having conversations with people about, well, what are your objectives? You know, what's your attitude to risk? What do you feel about this? What do you feel about that? You know, and, and mortgage advisors, I did this one comment the other day and I kind of said, a mortgage advisor would sit in front of a client and if the client came along and asked for a mortgage, as in an order taker, and asked for a mortgage that the advisor knew wasn't in the client's best interest or an investment strategy that they knew wasn't in the client's best interest, both of their attitudes are risk, you would never put that through. You turn around and you'd have the conviction in your ability as an advisor to spot something you knew wasn't compliant, wasn't in the client's best interest, and you'd never proceed with it. So why do we say it's acceptable with protection? Why do we make a recommendation and then just allow the client to just say, actually, no, I don't want that, I don't think that. And that's often down to the perception of the client in terms of how we present. We present with conviction our mortgage recommendation, our wealth recommendation, protection. I've heard advisors physically say the words, by the way, this isn't mandatory. And they diminish the advice immediately by trying to position it as something that is less than essential. And we all know how essential it is because it's the means by which all these other plans can be achieved. So I think we have a lot of work to do to start focusing on solution, not product. You know, when you talk about an investment or you talk about a mortgage, we don't talk about the product, we talk about the solution. You want to buy a home, you want to retire at this age, you want to have this much in the bank. We focus on the solution and then we match the product to the solution. Right, so the solution with protection is, oh, you want to feed your kids. You want to keep a roof over your head. You want to stop the fridge. You want to keep the lights on, the heating on. The basics that actually do matter to people. You want to be able to make sure at the end of every month you've got enough in the bank to pay for everything. Brilliant. Let me show you the solution to that. You want your family to stay in the home. Fine. Let me show you the solution to that. If we start shifting our perceptions, just like the AMI viewpoint says, into this more solution outcomes based advice process, these conversations will dramatically change because clients will perceive they're being advised, not sold to we will then start feeling like we're advising, not selling. And the dynamic just shifts, the tonality, the conversations, the language, everything changes and people will accept more of those recommendations, simple. Yeah, and I, th I thought, I saw your um, recent presentation at cover about objection handling like a pro. And I, I think, as you say, a lot of it is perhaps not kind of creating those barriers in our own minds, you know, as an advisor. I know I've, I've worked with advisors that have put those barriers up um, they've not even had the conversation. Or give the client an exit ramp straight away. Yeah, yeah it's, it happens all the time, doesn't it? Yeah. And I guess, you know, you spend a lot of time, though, coaching, coaching firms and kind of helping them to overcome some of these barriers. And, you know, I suppose the industry has a responsibility, though, to, 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 to support advisors and train mm. them and, and deliver kind of appropriate training, um, you know, to help. Because maybe one of the kind of challenges we've, as an industry, particularly the protection industry, we've kind of said to advise, you know, consumer duty changes things, you've got to discuss protection, but, you know, perhaps to some extent we've, we've not followed through on kind of delivering the, the, the resources and training. And I, I guess, that, you know, there's a real responsibility, isn't there, Gary, on kind of us as, you know, you know, as a product provider to deliver that support and training. Oh, absolutely. And I think it, interesting choice of words there with the fact of, of discussing, because I think we probably do spend a little bit too much time talking about that kind of sell. And I mean, to your point, this is not I'm trying to um, you know, push something on you that you don't necessarily want. I mean, of course, again, nobody goes out looking to buy insurance. In most cases, we do have to educate them and discuss it with them. Uh, and I think it probably just becomes less of a, a dirty word, that idea of I'm going to sell some protection versus you know, my role as an advisor is to provide you with the information you need to make an informed decision, educate. And I think Certainly, you know, ourselves, we've got a, a few courses that we're running to enable uh, advisors to kind of move away from that selling. Obviously, as soon as someone's sold to you, you recognize it and you know, persuasion resistance pops up. Um, rather than actually to sort of, I suppose, to not Zig Ziglar, but you know, get on the same side of the table as the client, become more of an assistant buyer. Uh, and certainly, obviously, working in conjunction with you know, the, the work that you're doing, really just helping advisors refocus and reframe that conversation away from you know just being a sell. That's actually a really good point about advisors not feeling like they're selling in the first place. You know it's one of the only aspects of financial advice where we think it's a sales process. That's a really valid point. A lot of the work I've been doing with firms actually is in almost getting them to think differently about that and I, I kind of keep saying to advisors it isn't about selling. We've got to stop seeing it that way. Don't get me wrong, I know you've still got to sell, of course we do, in the same way that you know you sell your wares as a mortgage advisor or a wealth advisor, why would you use our firm in the first place? But I think we've got to move away from this and think of it more from the point of view of actually we're building resilient households. I was on a, a call earlier this morning with a very successful firm and I love watching their faces light up earlier when I sort of started saying to them, 
you should be very proud of what you do. That there is a, a very strange misconception that we're doing something in some way that's negative. I often use the expression, you know, we're not selling drugs to kids here. Anything we do when we arrange protection is going to have a positive outcome, a positive impact on people. It's going to make people more secure, more financially robust. And I think that's something to be incredibly proud of. You know, we do tend to say, oh, well, you know, it's a lot of commission and we're selling insurance products. But in reality, we're not. We're doing something so much more. It's, it's undervalued in our industry. And I think we need to be far prouder of what we do. We make a fundamental difference to people. We make a fundamental difference to vulnerable communities. And I think that's something that we should all be a lot more proud of. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's so important, isn't it? And I know from you know, my past experiences working as an advisor that when you're on a, you know, when you get that call coming from a client that has claimed and you, and you kind of see the difference that that has made and it does sort of make you think, you know, what, what if I hadn't discussed protection with that client? What, what if right now they're ringing me up to say, you know, can I, you know, can I claim on my policy for such and such? And oh, actually, we didn't discuss that. It's really, that's, you know, it's funny because I said that exactly this this morning. Anyone that's processed a claim out there, anyone's watching, you know that that first sort of 15, 20 minutes as you're running around trying to find the policy docs is, is probably the worst 15, 20 minutes of your life. The blood drains, you start sweating, get the cold sweats. It's a very uncomfortable place to be and you're hoping to the Lord above, you did the right thing for the client. And I guess if you think that way, right, and it can ultimately, hopefully, end up being one of the most positive things that you've ever experienced, way better than someone buying their dream home, by the way, I should point that out. But I think if we focus on that as the driving, motivating force by making sure we have these right conversations, because what you don't want to do is be in that situation where you get that phone call and you haven't got the right answer. You know, when, and I've actually said this to a client, you know, when we're discussing protection, if they were being a little bit dismissive of what I'm saying, I said, well, look, you tell me that when that happens to you and you pick up the phone to me and you ask, did we do the cover? Did we do this? Did we do that? What is the answer you want me to give you? And that's a very good way of pushing it back to the client and sort of saying, listen, this is, this is a choice at the end of the day. Of course it is. But what we're doing is very important. And in that situation, you're going to want to know that we did the right thing for you. Yeah, it's so powerful, isn't it? So, and often it's, it's quite simple as well, isn't it? It's not, we're not, we're not, it's not it's rocket, rocket science. science. No, indeed. Um, you know, we, we obviously, we've spoken at length about sort of, you know, we, we've touched on a whole load of different things here. But I guess, you know, a lot of advisors will be watching this today that, that maybe have written a little bit of protection business or are looking to write more protection business. So, you know, Gary, kind of practically taking it down to a, a bit more of a simple level, practically speaking, advisors that want to start selling more protection, you know, what, what can they do? How, how can they kind of, start having those conversations? What, what, what do they need to do? What, what kind of advice can we offer them? Um, so I think for me, uh, there's often a focus on one specific need. And I think as soon as we start to broaden that conversation, you know, over than just maybe the mortgage, maybe talking about income, you know, later life planning, you know, a lot of the things that you have, uh, obviously a lot of the products that are out there will offer valuable value protection for, uh, for their clients. And I think if we just start to I suppose remove the, the blinkers to a certain extent to the wider need of that client. I think that you'll find that there are many more areas that we can start to support them in. Yeah, I guess it's a part of this is sort of thinking about the client holistically, isn't it? It's, it's, there may be a temptation for, for an advisor that's, I don't know, sold a mortgage to somebody to sort of think, OK, well, the default protection solution is you recommend term assurance. But I guess if we're thinking holistically about that client, I'm just thinking back to you know income protection awareness week recently and, and the sort of the, the uptick in interest around IP particularly. I guess if we start thinking holistically about our clients' needs, then that opens up opportunities, but it maybe makes it easier as well for an advisor to, to have these sorts of conversations. I mean, what two products build a more resilient household? Income protection and family income benefit, because income's bill and end all. You do those two products, ironically, some of the other ones become a little less important. Not saying you wouldn't do them, but they suddenly become a bit less important because you've made sure that that household always has the income it needs to achieve whatever it needs to achieve. I think for me, top tips I would say, this is practically speaking, tips I would probably give a firm right now. One, begin the protection conversation at the very beginning. Normalise it in the client's mind. Don't shy away from it. Don't wait till offer. Don't wait till post app. You do it at the very beginning and you align it to the client's objectives and goals. Don't let a client leave your offices, even if the mortgage can't go ahead, without making sure you've put them in a stronger financial position when they leave. Because if they are looking to buy a home, make sure you ring fence all the assets they need to be able to buy the home. So that would be my first thing. Secondly, product density. We all tend to focus on, like you say, transactional single product-led advice. Product density is the key. So for example, 
going back to my point earlier, if you've got a client who is looking to take out a mortgage and wants to make sure their family can stay in the home, don't just do mortgage life insurance. Make sure if there's a dependent ongoing income need, family income benefits there to make sure the outcome can be achieved. That will literally double your sales overnight simply because you've increased that product density to produce the right outcome. The other thing I would say is back book clients. Go back and fill gaps. Stay in touch with your clients and your reviews as a minimum. Make sure you're reviewing the client's protection needs. Fill any gaps. Talk about financial resilience. If you're worried about picking up the phone and speaking to a client because what you're thinking is, well, I didn't do that first time round and I don't want to undermine what I did previously, the simple answer is pick up the phone and say, look, the world has changed. Everything's changed. We've gone through recessionary period. We've got double digit inflation. We've got cost of living crisis, several wars going on. Post COVID, the world has changed. Previously, we may have focused on debt specifically. Nowadays, we focus on income and financial resilience. So my job now is to make sure we fill those gaps so you can borrow again in the future, regardless of what happens. Again, it's that holistic viewpoint. The other thing I would say is making sure you go for the highest quality products you can. What I mean by that is, if you've got a client sat in front of you, it's not about trying to extract as much premium from them as you can, but actually think about outcomes again, where you can focus on the quality of the product and how that then leads back to the outcomes for the client. So for example, if you're gonna be reckoning critical or serious illness product, for example, make sure you're going for the highest quality one that has the highest likelihood of paying out. If someone's already in a situation where they're prepared to invest in those types of products, they're investing in their own financial security, make sure you give them the biggest spread, the most comprehensive option, because what you don't want is to say to a client, oh, well, we looked at a product and actually there was one out there that would have covered you for this, but yeah, there you go. Again, bad outcome. So as an advisor, focus on making sure you're aiming for the top of the tree if you can. Um, move away from budget concerns. I, I think many advisors talk themselves out of sales. The other top tip I'd give, sorry, I'm probably rambling on now, but the other top tip I would give is that I've seen a lot of advisors that I've been coaching start off with full-term income protection, which of course we all know is the one that you want to go for, and they instantly drop down to a short-term plan or default to a lesser product if there's a whiff of objection from the client. That only serves to undermine the advice you've given. It actually then makes it feel very much like a sale again because you're now going, oh, well, you can make do with this. My argument there is, as advisors, and please try this if you're watching, recommend a full-term income protection plan. Do not abandon the advice. Stick to the knitting, stick to the concept, have conviction that the client needs that income for the remainder of their working life and beyond, and then work with the client to tweak elements of the policy to find one that works. But don't just abandon it and go straight to short term because what you're doing, one, undermining your own advice, and secondly, showing the client you're purely focused on the sale. If you have the courage of conviction, you'll find you will end up selling more full-term policies, which is great for you because ultimately you're going to earn extra income from the, from the commission of these policies, but ultimately you're producing the best possible outcome for the client. So right now, in this period when people are struggling, those are the kind of top tips I'd give. Just make sure you're maximising every opportunity by doing the right thing for the customer. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, really, I think really kind of useful practical advice um, for advisors. And I'm conscious you have spoken quite a bit about uh, new business opportunities, but I guess, you know, a lot of advisors at the moment will also be concerned about kind of existing business and a lot of worries around sort of cancellations and stuff like this. I mean, what, what can advisors do as well to kind of mitigate some of those risks that clients are going to cancel or, you know, they're going to sort of see X amount going out of their account each month and think, oh, I'll get rid of that. I've not claimed on that yet. Well, what can advisors that are sort of concerned about consistency and, and this sort of stuff do at this time practically? I mean, I think the first and most easy one is to reach out have a conversation you know, make sure that this is still something remind the client of the benefits of uh, of, of what they've taken out refresh the you know, the reasons why you recommended that plan maybe check that it is still uh, suitable of course you know consumer duty monitoring outcomes I think that plays a very very big part there but also I think you can remind that that client of the value adds that this policy comes with you know nowadays all policies are self included uh, have a lot more than just the ability to pay a claim and I think that reminder that you know, potentially if the client is going through a tough time, there is support available through these value adds. Or, you know, certainly when we consider the, the Vitality Rewards Package as a great way of offsetting some of the costs the client might be incurring in other areas uh, by really making sure they're engaging with that program and, and getting the most out of it. I was about to say engagement's key for me. Um, if you've got a product that the client is naturally engaged with that's helping them work towards, you know, using the Vitality concept as an example, working towards improved lifestyle benefits and you know doing things for themselves you know the number of clients i've seen who start on the sort of the quit smoking program or they're trying to get fitter in the gym 
and you know that's then integrated into their lifestyle and it stops being so much a product and i go back to my point it's more of a solution led advice process so absolutely i mean i completely agree the very first thing to do is to reach out to your customers that's the very first thing remind them of why they took it in the first place and the solution what it's actually offering them not the product not what it costs but what it's going to give them remind them of why it's so essential and then make sure you keep in contact with them. There is a natural danger, in my opinion, where you know advisors have been very busy, quite rightly as well, and I feel for a lot of firms out there where they've been so busy dealing with these mortgage products and these issues going on with the rates that they've been so busy with that that they've kind of let that slip a little bit. There's not a lot of point going after the front end if it's all falling off the back of the cart, right? Generally, it's more expensive to recruit new customers than it is to retain the ones you've got. So I would say commit resource, time, and energy to managing those client relationships. Don't wait two years or five years till that mortgage product comes back round again. This is the beauty of annual reviews. Annual reviews really help make you see where that policy is still fit for purpose. It makes you see all these additional opportunities, but just don't be afraid to pick up the phone. What you might find ironically is not only will you keep that product on the books, but you may even identify additional gaps or opportunities where that might not have been something you'd seen if you didn't have the conversation with the client. So all I would say is, there's a lot of advisors out there probably a little bit worried about picking up the phone to the client because there's this fear that, you know, you'll remind them of this expense. That's nonsense. That's absolute nonsense. You know, I think the key here is just going back to the client, reminding them of the value, as you say, you know, particularly, with, let's talk about Vitality for a minute, making sure they are engaging with the programme, driving that value, showing them what they can do from it, spending time with them, education again. I think this is really all about adding that additional value, that core value. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, a really good point because we, we see it in our own data and, and the like that actually when a client does engage and when we drive that engagement, actually their, their propensity to cancel is then reduced. So, you know, in our case, our most engaged members, actually they're less likely to cancel as a, as a result of that kind of engagement. And, you know, they're, they're unlocking value, they're, they're kind of getting benefits and, and the like out of the policy, which I suppose it, it delivers something that's a bit more tangible as well, doesn't it? And I guess that's one of the issues is, is that insurance always it's slightly intangible and it's it's delivering really valuable peace of mind but at a time when people are kind of worried about costs it can be quite hard to sort of to, to almost kind of to make make that seem real you know I'm, I'm paying x amount for the promise of a payout so i guess we we kind of have to do a little bit more as an industry to, to deliver kind of tangible value and benefits 100%. To... we're talking the other day about statements about how annual statements would be very very helpful to have those engaging conversations i know you guys obviously do your you know your benefit statements each year and things like that i think that's really crucial to helping spark those conversations and remind clients what they're doing i think one thing i would say and this is kind of language and phraseology that i've been using with firms i've been coaching is when you're speaking to clients i mean we are talking now about a cost and expense and i think we've almost ourselves got to move the client away from perceiving it as a cost and as expense. Firstly, it's an essential insurance contract. And secondly, I would argue that we should, we should be referred to it as an investment in the same way you would invest in your pension, same as you would invest in your property. You know, We should be treating protection as an investment in someone's financial security. And if you act that way and you treat it as an investment and you refer to it as an investment, it might just stop clients perceiving it as an expense or something that they can treat as an optional cost that they ought to be getting rid of. Just tiny, tiny bits of psychology there, I think. <laughs> I think one of the things that I think also proves that point is when we look at, obviously, indexation, you know, very, very key to, to pretty much any need you're insuring against. So we have the option to choose whether to utilise that indexation increase each year. We've seen over 90% of those policies that are indexed continuing to go through that indexation. And I think that really does just back up the fact that our clients do understand the importance of this and they can see yes there's an increase in premium there but the increase in cover and I need that because I recognize that everything has got more expensive and if we are looking at covering more than just one specific element this extended cover allows us to maintain that coverage on the wider base to, to support us and that's an engaged client but for, for a different reason yeah absolutely and, and you know you mentioned annual statements and it's it's such an important thing isn't it for the industry to, to really get behind and ensure that we you know just as a, as a bare minimum I think you know, reminding um, clients that they've got this cover in place or in our case reminding them of some of the benefits they've got and which benefits have they used and engaged with I think is such a you know, clearly such an important thing I know it's a topic that comes up <laughs> quite quite a bit um, we, yeah we, <laughs> the industry is perhaps not quite there yet but um, I think just just coming back to a point that we've, we've sort of touched on as well I kind of you know we've said there about delivering better value for, for consumers and these sorts of things and you know more kind of holistic advice I guess 
you know, to some extent then, in what way do the products and solutions maybe kind of need to move with the times a little bit here? And you know, I mentioned at the beginning, obviously there's a whole heap of different challenges that we face. We've got on the one hand kind of economic, but on the other, we are seeing things like deteriorating population health. We are seeing record numbers of people out of work. And you know, I guess if, if advice needs to be more holistic, then maybe the solutions that we're offering, the protection solutions we're offering consumers, Gary, maybe they, you know, we need to think a bit more holistically about those as well. Oh, well, certainly. And we come back to the point about you know, dual purposing any recommendations that you're making. You know, we've seen, I think we're now over 70,000 vitality plan holders making use of the dementia and frail care benefit. So obviously going from that, that point, and obviously again, we've seen in the past sort of convertible term assurance, and ultimately that's, that's what this product is, is designed to, I suppose not emulate, but provide the support against, because you know, we get to the end of our working lives or our mortgage term, that is definitely not the end of our need for protection and certainly when you consider the ability to have your plan flip over to dementia and frail care cover to co cover you for those later life you know, issues it's a conversation that's happening so much more frequently now we're, we're i'm sure we've all seen examples of you know uh, family members loved ones having to go down that journey of, uh, of those later life conditions dementia alzheimer's parkinson's those sort of things and not only of course dealing with the sort of emotional upshot of that and also the financial one. And I think being able to recommend something that will do that thing you wanted it to do today, but give you the option to continue this, to meet that later need to, I suppose it's probably not a, a, a barrier that we come up against too much nowadays, but you know, what happens if I never claim on this policy? Do I ever get anything back? Well, it hopefully helps to challenge that. I mean, obviously the, the financial security that this has offered you and your family for the duration of the term, I think is the obvious point there. But I think being able to, to offer that you know, just one step more, multi sort of multi purpose that recommendation, I think is, is so key. And obviously, things like dementia and frail care cover really uh, help do that. Well, it becomes even more comprehensive, doesn't it? That's the whole point. You know, when we talk about holistic advice, it's about, well, we don't know what's around the corner. That's the reality of every situation. It's the reason we recommend protection products because we can't control what's going to happen to us. We can't control the environment. We can't control how bad it's going to be. So the best we can do using protection contracts is mitigate the financial consequences of that. We can protect ourselves from the losses and try and ensure that we're robust enough to be able to cope in those situations. So I think from my perspective, that's a really great option to have. I and mean, what I've seen, interestingly, in terms of the, the flexibility and, and, and products moving with the times, I mean, income protection, we've seen a huge uptake in income protection recommendations and, and, and clients taking out those policies. What I would like to see is obviously a little more in the income protection space around the flexibility in contracts. You know, there is still a lot of challenges when we talk about gig economy and fluctuating incomes. I know there's a lot of work being done, um, you know, self-employed incomes. I know you guys ha have solutions for things like that. And I think that's where a lot of evolution needs to take place. These products have to try and keep up with changes in the wider economy, particularly at this time. Um, one of the other things I've been noticing recently is a huge interest in children's critical and serious illness cover. That's been something that's been, become a very hot topic for parents. And I think that comes down to another great opportunity, by the way, for advisors when they're discussing these policies, because what parent alive is going to sit there and not want to have that conversation? I mean, you've got a very young child yourself. That's something that as a parent, you are instantly going to find of value because thinking about it these days, you know, you've got probably two parents potentially in a household working young child and the reality of that child becoming significantly ill is going to put huge demands on the household and as a parent and i often use this expression i would want to know that i could just down tools tomorrow and spend whatever time i needed to with my child taking them through that process supporting them being there holding their hand through that process because no parent would want to have to be forced to continue to work in that situation so i think moving with the times covering as many of the bases we possibly can ensuring that the products remain suitable for the wider needs of our clients. And I think the example you gave there, Dementia and Frailco covers a very, very positive one. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, we're coming back to consumer duty. When we think about outcomes, there's, there's not a kind of static outcome. It's actually, no. what's that product going to do for the whole, you know, potentially really. for the whole duration of that client's life? How's it going to support them? I think it's probably really important. Uh, absolutely. And I think the, I mean, the one thing I want to add into that, of course, is something key to what the, we do at Vitality is this whole piece around prevention. Mm. Because with all the best will in the world, you know, every provider is going to be able to make payments. I know, obviously, the, the AMI report highlights, unfortunately, that perception on how frequently these policies do pay out. I mean, I think it's always worth just reminding in the industry total is seven billion pounds a year, 97% claims paid. 
you know, the idea that the industry only pays out 66% of the time is, is quite a Lackable. damning one, to be honest with you. But um, I think if we can put that one to one side and just consider the, the support that you can offer by incentivizing a client to make those healthier choices, those, the engagement that that can offer. And I think we highlighted this in our recent claims and benefits report, you know, 41% improvement in mortality. That's a significant number of clients that are taken out of vitality plan that are going to see the benefits, not just from a payout, but also from preventing that. And of course, you know, we move into the IP space and you're right, you know, the, the growth we've seen here is, has been significant. Uh, you know, our recent introduction to include our private medical recovery pathways for mental health, musculoskeletal and mm -hmm. cancer claims, obviously 75% of all IP claims. That is us, that is us as, a, as an insurer, specifically looking to help clients prevent claims prevent being ill, probably the better way to think about that, and then get them back to work, get them back to full fitness as quickly as possible. And I think that you know, it just it moves away from that, just write a check. Obviously, I know we don't write checks anymore. I think from my perspective, to, to kind of cap that off and, and finish off, I guess I'd say, for me, the best possible outcome that we ever have is a client spends a load of money on an insurance contract they never needed. That is, ironically, that is the best outcome isn't it I appreciate you know you might argue it's a waste of money but it means the clients lived a full happy healthy life and they've never needed to claim on their policy so having those preventative measures having those engagement tools that then drive that scenario is always going to be the best possible outcome for the client because we want to reduce the likelihood of paying out I appreciate it benefits the insurance company as well because it's you know it's, it's a win-win-win isn't it but ultimately I think the measure of a true positive outcome is that we have more people living longer, being fit and healthy, and not needing to claim on their policies. And ultimately, I appreciate that it means that we sort of become a bit redundant, but isn't that a great, great potential outcome for everyone? Yeah, absolutely. You know, you say it's, it's, a, it's good for everyone. It's good for society. It's good for those clients. It's, it's good for everybody, really, isn't it? So, um, well, look, that's been a really, I think, a really fascinating kind of, um, we've taken a, you know, an interesting journey through, I think, a really kind of big topic. Um, and we could have spoken for hours Probably. about this. But, um, you know, I hope, I hope everybody who's uh, watching has found it really useful. Um, I think some fantastic um, takeaways, I think, there for, for advisors that are looking to, to grow their protection business at this time. Um, so it just leaves me to, to thank Matt and, and Gary for, for being here today. Thank it's been, been really insightful, interesting conversation. As I said, this, is, this kicks off the first of our um, of our winter program of content. So keep an eye out, um, make sure you're registered for, for the other webinars coming up, um, as I said, in January and February. And it just leaves me to say once again, thank you very much for attending and for, for, for uh, tuning in today. And thank you once again to Matt and Gary for joining me. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you.